Welcome to the Industry Angel Podcast. We hear from the best business minds across the globe. Entrepreneurs, social influencers, marketing mavens, and sales rock stars. We've got them all. Here comes your weekly dose of inspiration with your host, Ian Farah. Joining us today from Los Angeles, we have with us the president of the athletic shoe company, K-Swiss, with a strong knowledge of marketing, brand strategy, and a passion for culture and organizational strategy. He is featured in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Entrepreneur, even guested on shows such as the Ask Gary V show. But today, my friends, he has reached the pinnacle. Today, he's a guest on the Industry Angel podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, Barney Waters. Thank you. Great to be here. How was that introduction for you? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I've got to make sure I re- play that back a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm really glad you've joined us. So uh, we've got about, what are we, five by six here in the UK? What about you? Five by ten? Yeah, 10 a.m. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 10 a.m. And before how hot it was, let, it, let us all know. Rub it in, Bonnie. What, the weather? Yes, come on, rub it in. 80 degrees, blue, clear blue skies, but this is sort of every day, to be honest. They always stay <laughs> in the day, turn sunny. Hey, how's, uh, how's lockdown for you over there in LA? Yeah, it's not been bad. I think um, yeah, I'm in a nice situation, so I feel lucky about that. You know, good family and nice house and weather's good. And, you know, been super uh, functional in terms of the productivity of the team using all the, you know, I use Microsoft Teams and things like that. It's been great. So, you know, business is terrible, obviously, with everything shut down, but um, the actual functioning of it all has been has been pretty good. No it's, it's interesting. You, you say business is terrible and some of the brands that I, I like to, to wear, you see the emails coming through and it's, the offers are crazy. So if you've got a bit of spare cash, now is the time to be getting the uh, your deals. Yeah, in. absolutely. Yeah, and that's because, you know, so, so what's happening is obviously stores are closed down, e-commerce has really spiked. And um, and but it's all it's pretty promotional. So everyone's using discounts to drive that to try and offset the the decline in uh, physical retail. So you're seeing a lot of great offers out there right now. Absolutely. And then, of course, it's going to continue because when things do open up, everybody's got all you know two months of inventory that's been sitting there. that They've got mm. to move through now. And, and especially if it's seasonal, because, you know, um, spring goods, sandals or whatever it might be. Uh, have a lifespan as we people start focusing now on buying for for the colder months. You know that that season starts around June. People start buying um, for Q3, and they're not looking for the for the seasonal stuff. So that's going to get discounted as well. So that's all part of the business is managing that cycle of goods. Yeah, yeah. Wow. We lost you for a second there, Bonnie. I hope your children on stream and Netflix. No, I've given them strict instructions to be off. <laughs> I tell you what is on the subject of Netflix. You've been watching Sumlin till I die, haven't you? Yeah, loved it. Yeah, marathoned it. Uh, Excellent. Couldn't get enough. Well, I tell you, it's been a while since you've been to Craven Cottage. Is it Stevenage Road? Is that where you would have walked down towards? Well, we we were always going to the Bridge train station. My dad used to take me there. Yeah, and yeah. Um, as a Fulham fan, and back in those days, we were in Division the old Division Three, so we were terrible. So it was never. It was still not good now, but. Uh, at school, you know, everyone supported the, the top team. And of course, I was the only, I was a Fulham fan and we were rubbish. <laughs> so how long has it been since you've been back over? Uh, well, I usually get to come to England at least sort of two, at least two, three times a year I'll come over. And if I do business in Europe, I'll, um, you know, I'll come and I'll go through Heathrow and I'll stop off at the families, which is near there. So now I get to stay connected and um i still love to go carp fishing so every time i come home i'll do a oh, day really? in the lakes and go go fishing with my old buddies who i used to fish with when i was you know 15 years old i'm still wow. same, same guys we talk about the same stuff <laughs> <laughs> nothing much changes then no no why, why do you uh tell us a little bit about that so you, you mentioned you were carp fishing what do you what do you do in la then what's what's your hobbies now oh goodness well now you know i, I think it's so different out here um and I loved, uh, you know, I, I sort of grew up in um, south of London, so, you know, leafy suburbs. So I used mm-hmm. to, like, go into the, you know, the, the, the forests and all that and go fishing and walking around. And there's none of that out here. It's all dusty desert 
types that's really different but here you know we go to the beach you know with the we're not far from malibu it's probably a half an hour drive to the beaches of malibu so on the weekends in the summer we'll go down there and the kids will go surf and um and we we hike around the mountains here and all that sort of stuff so um yeah yeah it's a good life um but far from home yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's it sounds like hell on earth bonnie i tell you so yeah down I my do, you know my I paid my dues. I was in England for a long time, and then I was in Boston for 13 years. And Boston is, you know, one of the tough winters in America. That Northeast gets like heavy snow every year. So I spent a lot of years in Boston shoveling snow, and so I feel like I paid my dues. So how do you end up over in the states? And is that through is that through a work role? Yeah, Actually, I, why did you wind us back? Because you, you you worked for Puma and stuff. Like that. So I want you to take us right back to the start of your uh, your career. Yeah, well, I was just ready to go. You know, when I was young, I was just always wanting to be a businessman. That was sort of my my vision. And I wasn't even sure what kind of business. I think I wanted to be in sales. And I was just sort of just weirdly motivated and um, hungry as a kid of like, let's go. I want to be in be a, be successful and um, things like that. And and I think maybe I I don't know where I got it from. Maybe my granddad was a was I always looked up to him, and he was a business guy. And my dad was a salesman and so anyway i ended up working selling like telephone sales in a in a in a company in stains sunny sunny stains and um yeah long story short i did that for a year then i got a job at a company called lotus which was a software company and it was an american-based software company but its uk headquarters was in stains and i got my way into marketing there and after about four years of working there i applied for a job at headquarters in boston massachusetts so I was 23 and um, I got the job. I flew over for an interview, which was like amazing, you know, like what the hell's happening and uh, got the job. And so I moved over at, at 23. I moved to, to America with two suitcases and um, and and that was about 20, <laughs> 24 years ago. Was that Lotus as in Lotus 1, 2, 3? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Lotus 1, 2, 3 and then Lotus. Oh, no wow. the, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure my, I'm sure my age, aren't I? Yeah, absolutely. That was like printing money back then because you're selling discs. You know, it's like data on a disc. So the cost of goods is nothing. And they, you pay about £350 for a software package. It probably cost, you know, £3 to make. So the margin was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, was this? Yeah. So, um, so that's when you kind of got into marketing then. Um, exactly. Yeah, so when I was at um, Lotus, it was such a great company, American company, really great people. Like I learned so much from so many great people. And then I moved over to HQ and I had a visa, you know, so I could only, it was a sponsored visa. I had to work there. So I couldn't really work anywhere else. So I worked there for about seven years until I got my green card, which allowed me to be work anywhere. And that's when I um, got my foot in the door at uh, Puma. Mm. And I went from technology, which was not really my cup of tea, to be honest, to to trainers, which was like, oh, my God, it was like a dream, you know. And um, and, and I ended up, you know, I went into to run marketing for North America. I ended up being VP of marketing for the for for the US for, for Puma, a dream job. And, yeah, did that for, for about seven years until I, I got a call from K-Swiss who'd bought an old boot company called Palladium. I don't know if you remember Palladium boots. I don't, no, no, no. Yeah, if you saw them, you probably would recognize the style. It had a, like a toothy bottom and a rubber toe cap. Okay. It was an old military boot worn by the French Foreign Legion. And um, it, it was a fashion item in the 90s. We used to wear them. Uh, and uh, yeah, I so I, I actually went to work for K-Swiss, but to rebuild this sub-brand that they bought called Palladium. And we did a we did a good job with that. So eventually, I moved upstairs, and they they brought me up to the to the parent brand. And then, long story short, I've ended up running that over the you know found my way to the corner office. So is it still uh, like family owned? Is, is the the founder still got a shareholding? Person? No, no. So, so K Swiss was run by a guy, uh, the Nichols family, Stephen Nichols, when who hired me from Puma. And then um, it got bought by a Korean company. It was really struggling. And so it got bought uh, pennies for the dollar by a Korean company. And then more recently, like less than a year ago, it got bought by a Chinese company. So I've worked for the original family, the Korea, the Korea ownership, and now the Chinese ownership. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, uh, are you left to your own devices, Barney? When there's a when there's a change of ownership, do they just say, "Look, it's not broke. Don't you know? Don't play with it." No, that's not how. <laughs> <laughs> I admire your honesty. <laughs> that's why I asked you. Yeah, no. When somebody pays, you know, hundreds of millions for something, um, they 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 want to they want to have control of what they're doing with it, and they're 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 hands on. So, you know, I think. Obviously, you know, when you're owned by a bigger company, they want to know what's happening with the financials on a week to week, month to month basis. So there's a lot of those kind of check ins. Um, and then um, bigger picture, they're going to obviously want to steer the the five year game plan of, you know, are we in, uh, you know, where do we see this thing going? Because it's our investment. And and then obviously they want to make sure I'm aligned with with that vision and can make it happen. So. Um, it's collaborative, but ultimately, I think you know you've got to always know who's who owns it and whose company it is, and um, and listen to what that you know you've got to listen to what they want and try and uh, execute against that. The creator, the founder of Kate Swiss, then back in sixties, was it? Uh, no, so so the the um, the company was founded in nineteen sixty six by two Swiss yeah. brothers who moved to America, and then okay. it was bought by the Nichols family in um, probably in the 80s, somewhere in the 80s. Right, okay. So and, thinking about any, I was just going to say, yeah. thinking about people who've had endorsements then through cases, who would we, who would we know across the years, across the decades? Oh, probably, you know, one of the, um, well, first of all, it's a tennis brand. So Caseus's core business is tennis. So even though most of the stuff we sell is casual, um, the bigger names would have been uh, in tennis was Anna Kornikova was a K-Swiss uh, player. There was two, uh, a doubles uh, partnership called the Woodies, um, who were one of the most successful doubles teams of all time, who you probably recognize if you saw them. They were K-Swiss guys. And more recently, the Bryan brothers were a men's doubles team who are, who are by far the most meddled um, tennis pairing of all time. They actually beat, took over from the Woodies. They're longtime K-Swiss guys. And um, and then on the casual side, either that we've done loads of things over the years. There's been tons of celebrities and uh, wearing it because in the sort of 90s and 2000s, it blew up to be a really big uh, kind of style brand. You know, you would have seen it like 100 different shoes on the wall of, J of a JD Sports, for example. That was kind of case with his heydays in the mid 2000s. So thinking about those endorsements and that, that that that's led me nicely on, and I think you said something about a five-year plan. And so let let's plumb into the entrepreneurship, the startup kind of world. Then, obviously, um, some of the the shoes that have came out that there is actually a sneaker called the startup, and then obviously you've kind of yeah. uh, aligned yourself with the entrepreneurship space, and obviously the collaboration with Gary V. So you know, let's let's drill into that if you don't mind. Yeah, so that really came from uh, when I took over to say, what are we going to, how are we going to bring this brand back to life? And when I looked at the market, you know, Nike is by is so dominant. All right, so you walk into any sort of like Foot Locker store, you know, sixty percent of the store is one brand, right? And then if you take Adidas uh, as that, now you're at sort of over eighty percent of the store. And if you add in who those brands own, so Nike owns Converse and um adidas owns reebok and then obviously nike with jordan so if you take all those you're now most of the store and you've got a little slice left for mm. what, what are big brands asics puma new balance uh vans all these big powerful billion dollar brands fighting over less than 10 percent share potentially and then you've got a little k swiss so you're going to get smashed if you try and go head to head with those guys at their own game. And this is true of any business. You know, if you, um, you've got to sort of ask yourself, what am I doing differently? You know, what, why does the world need me? Um, what am I the only one at? And so looking at sports, sneakers for sports, I'm like, there's no way anyone's going to want to, I could, I can't win with K-Swiss. And then if you, looked at what happened in the industry adidas had really moved and shifted the attention to celebrities so they signed kanye and pharrell and two chains and they're doing tons of this uh stuff i think in the uk they probably had like Stormzy or someone was wearing the uh mm -hmm. the so they sort of said hey athletes are a little old-fashioned let's shift to these new heroes of youth culture which are the rappers or the musicians and they stole a lot of energy um, from from Nike by doing that, and I thought there's no way I can beat Adidas at who can sign the biggest rapper. And Puma was also at the same time then signing Rihanna and The Weeknd and 
it was like an arms race of who can sign the biggest celebrities with Adidas and Puma and who can be the most core sport between say Nike and Under Armour. And for me, I just knew that we couldn't win at either of those. So we said, look, there's a third path here that is um, entrepreneurship. And if you actually really talk to young people, they're not trying to just be the best runner or the, or the, the or a rapper. They actually want to be CEOs now and run businesses and build brands and, it's almost like the new aspiration of young people is entrepreneurship. And by recognizing that little potential thread, we said, let's line up against that and make our muse the young entrepreneur and it will give us an open lane. So we say, hey, you want to be the fastest runner? That's cool. You should go talk to Nike. If you want to be the cool kid at the party, <laughs> then this is your brand. But if you want to be the boss, then you should listen to us. <laughs> I'm just laughing because I was talking to you yesterday about Nike and I, and uh, I made a bit of an error and I went running with a Nike with a Nike hoodie on uh, for a case with video. Yeah, great move. Sorry, man. <laughs> but hang on. Seen the video. I haven't even seen the video yet. But hold on, hold on, hold on. There you go. Oh, uh, brilliant. Oh, yeah. Those so those are the um the those are the crushing it ones. Yes. Those um, were, were were we made to celebrate Gary's book launch, and the, I think we only made like we only made maybe two hundred and fifty pairs of those. Those are probably the rarest. I should have put those on made. eBay. Why? Yeah. I'm walking. I'm walking around in them. I could have these on eBay, couldn't I? Absolutely. There's not many pairs That's of those around. Crazy. Nah, nah. <laughs> so, so yes, I'm on brand. Yeah. So, so once we'd honed in on this idea of entrepreneurship as this sort of new aspiration of young people, and it gave us this really fresh voice that no one in sneakers was using because it's like a formula like sneakers or trainer plus athlete equals marketing. We just flipped, flipped it. And then I, then I reached out to Gary V because we were thinking, who's our Jordan? OK, so who's the face of this? And I was sort of looking for who's you need someone who's young and cool looking, someone who's got that appeal. But there was no one that was kind of got that image but was also a legitimate entrepreneur and all roads kept pointing to Gary Vee but he was not your typical sneaker endorser because he's 40 years old and you know what I mean he's dropping f-bombs all the time but the more I looked just there was no other choice it was him he was the voice and so I reached out to him and said let's make the first signature sneaker for an entrepreneur because that will really like twist people's heads like you know mm -hmm. you always got the the basketball sneaker version of um, of the Nike. I'm like, let's do an entrepreneur's signature K Swiss, and it'll blow people's minds. And so, and he replied, you know, like, let's do it. He was down for it. So, and that sort of started. We now we end up doing ten different sneakers over a few years and sold fifty thousand pairs. And you know, it's it was a great great partnership, and still is. In, in, in terms of the, the entrepreneur, then Barney, it, is that what you're seeing now from a fashion point of view? Are the days of suits and uh, certainly ties and that kind of thing gone? Is, is that what is that what you're finding now? That's what the entrepreneur yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, no, no question. And I think, um, but and I think you know, to be honest, like here's an interesting thing, and this is a quote someone has said: "Is like never trust somebody wearing a suit." you know, because they're covering up for something, you know, like we're in an era now of transparency. Like it doesn't matter if I'm wearing a t-shirt or if you're in a t-shirt or if you have a beard, you never would have had a beard. Uh, you know, like IBM used to, because Lotus was owned by IBM, they had a policy of no facial hair. If you were a manager, you weren't allowed to have a beard. You know what I mean? Like this is old fashioned, really? but, right. But now um, wow. it's like, we it's just show who you are and i can tell and you can tell if someone's trustworthy you know genuine smart just by listening you don't need to be w dressing up to pretend to be someone something you're not just and i think that transparency is proper is, is a greater cultural trend that we're seeing not only in people but also in businesses and brands like people want to know who's working there it's not like a faceless yeah. gray company anymore it's like let me hear you and that's why we do things like this is like we'll tell you what we're thinking and who we are because consumers kind of want to know before they give you the money like do you share my values are you good people yeah 100 percent. you know it is i'm a bit strange i love social media and I, I, I i'm strange in terms of before i buy a brand i'll jump on and i'll look 
what their values are like through some of their social content. Yeah. Uh, a lot of tweets, and even things like, I don't know, like Anka, for instance, who, who do uh, speakers and, and, and headphones and things like that. You know, I, I really want to know if they're engaging. And if it's also all broadcasting, I want to see that two-way street. I want to see the engagement and answering back with. Is that, is that yeah. something that K-Swiss has uh, a policy for from a social media point of view? Are they listening as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, first of all, I've got a great social community manager who's probably listening in, Omar Presswich. So, um, and he, I found him through the Gary V thing. He was, he was, yeah, he was attending the um, Gary V events as a customer, and we end up getting to know each other. And I hired him in the end, and he's the social manager, so he's twenty four seven replying, and 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 I'll reply too, uh, and look on it. And I think I think you have to like, is you've got to be genuinely connected to people and. I remember when I was a kid in England, I used to ride BMX bikes, right? And I used to, and there was a Dr. Pepper contest where you could ride in and, and do a tagline for Dr. Pepper. And I ended up winning a Dr. Pepper, like BMX jersey. Yeah. I was probably 10 years old, right? I still have an affinity for that brand because of that little, I felt like I was the only winner. And my tagline was terrible looking back, but... <laughs> You know what I mean? And and yeah. but I, that connection moment with that brand recognized me and heard me. And to, to this day, I still hold that brand in a certain place. Um, so so if you make real connections with people as a company, it can it can really have an effect. So I would encourage everybody in their businesses, even big businesses, is to to really personalize as much as you can and reach out. And you know, talk about Gary V. I mean, that guy is like talk about personal attention he pays people you know this is this guy's so busy he's so big now in terms of who everybody wants a piece of him and yeah. i swear to you he texted me the other day just to be like just checking in how you doing and i thought to myself like me and gary don't talk all the time but i was like damn he has the time to um go oh well, let me just reach out to a few people just to sort of be like how you do you know yeah. That's, that's the guy he is. It's really genuine and, and it makes such, and that's why he's such, such a following. So I think if we as brands can follow that same um, philosophy, it will go a long way. Yeah. Something I'm really passionate, Barney, about it is co company cultures and values. And, and I think um, I can feel that in you as well. So what do you look for, Barney, in an employee then? Well, that's a good question. And, and you know, I think I've, I've thought a lot about company culture and I, I really believe that the number one thing that can um, create positive culture is success. OK, it's not free donuts or ping pong table or, you know, yeah. that, and that, you, you know, you need to, we do need to do that stuff. We do that stuff. But the biggest thing I can do for company culture is to try and get the company profitable because then people get pay raises and bonuses and people have their chest out a little bit more and feel confident a bit more. So driving the company towards profitability or hitting your targets is the number one thing any executive can do for, uh, for culture. And I haven't, and I'm not successful at that all the time. You know, I'm working towards that. I'm not saying I've nailed that one. I'm that's what I'm sweat, blood, sweat and tears every day. Um, so, so that's the biggest thing is 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 try and be successful because everyone wants to work for a winner, and that's definitely maybe that's an American thing too because American culture is very much about success and winning and personal. Am I? Yeah, it's very like sort of self focused on success mm. culturally here, but in terms of people, I think the number one thing is I want someone who's passionate about K Swiss. So I will take that over smarts any day of the week. So if somebody comes in and goes. Hey man, I've di I've listened to your vision of this thing. I've I've followed the Gary V stuff. I'm like, I used to wear the brand back in the day. Like, I want to be part of this. I'm like, already thinking I want this person. Somebody comes in and says, Hey, I've got a PhD in this, that, and the other, and I've worked at Nike for my whole life. And yeah, you know, K Swiss is a bit shit, but I'll give it a crack. <laughs> no, not interested. You know what I mean? So you need believers. That's the biggest thing. When you, especially when you're working with um, brands, and and when you're on a staging a comeback or trying to bring an old brand back to to life, you need people who really believe in the in the in the vision and the mission. It sounds a bit corny, but it's so true. In terms of those employees, Bonnie, do you um, do you put an arm around the shoulder of some of the younger ones that are coming through? And is that something that excites you? See seeing them progress and, and being able to mentor them. Absolutely. But only, you know, I, I'm pretty selective with that. I think it's like, 
you can see who the people are who really care and who and if you care and are, and are trying to get somewhere then absolutely i'll spend a lot of time with you and coach and do all of that stuff because that was me you know i was that you know, it was like i used to be young and hungry and a go-getter and now look at me i blink my eyes i'm an old i'm old and washed up but that used to be me i was the youngest in the room every meeting you know and um and i i look back and i know all the people who i used to like look up to and follow and um try and emulate I had loads of them in my career. That's probably the thing I was luckiest about. Great bosses, great um, people in the companies I work for who I could learn from and who were just experts, professional, you know. And so hopefully I can be that now for some other people. But you could tell who are the ones who really are interested in learning versus the other ones who just show up and, like, i got other offers I could go do, you know. And I, I, I'm not interested in spending that much time on those, on those people, to be honest. And I, and I think I would be a better manager if i did you know i think the best managers are selfless in that way and that's probably something that i i could improve on what what do you do in terms of communication barney do you get in front of the the, the team and do a, a big town hall meeting every so often and yeah absolutely all the time i mean i'm i'm definitely like a sleeves rolled up sort of person i'm not sitting in a in a in a actually i don't sit in the corner office i sit in the middle of with everybody else um my door's always open i'm not like ivory tower i'm in on the details all the time and anyone will tell yeah. you that and i think um i think sometimes you know people may be like god get out of my business you know so you've got to try and balance being engaged but not but letting people do their jobs you know i've always been a fan of or a believer that you've got to hire people who are better than you at what they do um and the worst management mistake is like I, i'm the I'm the president, so I know more than everyone about everything. So then they just yeah. look at me like, why do you need us? If you're a good hirer of talent, you should be hiring people better than you at marketing, sales, product. And your job is kind of like a, a jack of all trades, um, master of none, and steering the ship sort of thing. So, um, But we do town halls once a month. I do this thing called standing room only, which is every Wednesday. We no one sits down so it's everyone just gathers in the, in, a, in an area of the office so that it's quick because no one sits down right so it's like 10 minute 15 minute and i'll go here's what's happening this week because i realized that people would were saying we got some feedback from people and they were saying like yeah we don't know what's going on we're you know we're here working but we don't know what we don't get enough communication i'm thinking my god there's only a cluster of us that work together how can you not know what's going on but it was true that people weren't hearing the bigger picture of uh, so. So now once a week, I'll get everyone together and be like, OK, here's the big things that's happening. And that's it. And it's just overly communicating. And we, we've kept that going through the quarantine. We do now we do standing room only on uh, on, on Zoom on our Microsoft Teams. And um, I try and just tell everyone what's going on again. Transparency, communication, honesty. People appreciate that, I think. Could you change that, Barney, just for a laugh and just do plank only? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'd be the shortest meeting ever. <laughs> It'd be under 30 seconds for me, I can tell you that. <laughs> Listen, we, we talked before about ideas and ideas around social. Who's taken the plaudits for the Kenny Powers YouTube videos? Well, that was before my time, and and uh, right, okay. and that was actually I think that was when I was at Palladium. So I was in the building, but I was downstairs working on my own brand with a small team. About five of us were doing Palladium, but that Kenny Power stuff happened upstairs. And yeah. I'll tell you, you know, looking back, it was one of the most viral campaigns. I mean, it was brilliant creatively. Um, it didn't move the needle for the brand. I can also tell you that. So, wow. no, no, from my so, point of view. It was fantastic, right? So I think it was great for Kenny Powers and it was great for the show. Um, but for K-Swiss, I think when you, if I actually look back as a, and it's easy to criticize somebody else's stuff, but you've got to have all three legs of the stool in place for that thing to work. And I think the marketing there was way ahead of product and sales. So the marketing team created this magical moment of awareness that everybody was talking about this campaign. But then if you walked into a store, you never saw the shoes. And so the demand you created, you couldn't fulfill. Do you know what I'm saying? And it, this was pre kind of e -com being an obvious place to go. You walked into a Foot Locker, there was like one shoe on the shelf. And so even though you may have been top of mind, 
you've got to then make that connection at the point of sale that somebody then sees a picture of, oh i've seen that thing and maybe i'll pick that shoe up and then the other thing is that shoe itself that was kind of behind the campaign was not really uh i would say up to snuff in terms of the you know the the trend of the time so again i'd say like 10 out of 10 for mark the marketing team at that time and then but but the other two legs of the stool were not aligned and so yeah. it didn't really move the needle and that's probably the learning from that that's really interesting i think if anybody um wants to have a look they'll probably be on youtube to, to have a look out there they're pretty crazy yeah amazing Think, thinking about the brand then barney and obviously you have touched upon them the focus on entrepreneurship and, and startup does that dilute the other aspects of the brand or do you go all in and say that's what we want to be known for now or like we're no longer doing tennis we're no longer doing running or whatever it's this yeah so so that's a good question so the the roots of k-swiss is a heritage american tennis brand okay so that's the case this is 1966 founded in California for tennis right so that's the foundation mm. but it's not enough to like nobody gets up in the morning and says I want to be a heritage American tennis person today you know it's like it's factual but it's not as it's not so, somebody doesn't want to buy into that do you, yeah. you know what I mean? yeah so I think it's really a, a case of modernizing those values. So you can't then suddenly go from being a tennis brand to say, hey, I'm going to suddenly be something totally unrelated because consumers, once they get something in their mind about what you are, it's really hard to change it. So you yeah. have to almost just like make min minute shifts to like take people with you on a journey to something new. They're like, OK, I'll go with you here because it kind of passes the what I think the brand is. Yeah, that sounds about right. So if you took Heritage American Tennis and this idea of the country club, and this idea of preppy, and I'm not sure, do you know what preppy is? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like a little smart, uh, the country club and the tennis club is the leather couches, the dusty trophy cabinet. It's it's affluent, it's premium, it's tennis, it's like older guys negotiating business deals, right? And it's rich. So those are good um, old fashioned values, but what, if, but what if you modernize them? And the modernization of that country club is like a shared workspace it's like a we work or it's a soho house or um some of those like clubs and that's now where young people are going and doing the same thing they're smart they're rich then negotiating business deals they're networking and um and and now it's it's multicultural it's dual gender there's female ceos there's um all different types of looks of people who are running businesses and so i think the idea of being entrepreneurial is is the modernization of preppy in my mind. So, so no one wants to live in a museum, but they were like, okay, I respect that Caseus has heritage and authentic roots, but like, what does it stand for today? If I wear this shield, what does that say about me? Okay, well, someone sees me wearing K Swiss now, they might go, oh shit, Gary V and the entrepreneur thing. And if somebody sees that shield and goes, oh, you run a business, like, what's your what's your hustle? Then. Right now, if I see someone wearing Under Armour, I might be like, or if I see someone wearing, say, like uh, a Hoka or, or Asics, I'm like, oh, you're a runner. Oh, do you do any marathons? Mm. Whereas if I'm wearing yeah. K Swiss, I'm like, hey, you go into the um, the Newcastle startup thing, whatever you know, the <laughs> New South Wales. <laughs> New South Wales. What was I thinking of? I've been watching Newcastle start a week all week. My mind trying to run this this hard. So, you know, it, in terms of the shield you, you talk about there, would, would you ever look at changing something that, I mean, I know these things are iconic and they're set in stone. Have you had this, have you had discussions about that? Yeah, in fact, we've done it where there is a modern version of the shield. If you Google K-Swiss logo, you'll see it. And because the first thing I did when I came in and said like, man, that logo looks old fashioned. So we created a modern version and someone in our graphic design department created it and, and, and it did a hell of a job. It's beautiful, modern, simplified, minimalist shield. Um, and right about that same time, what became the biggest trend in the world was like retro 90s fashion. So, you know, the feelers, the LS all came back. So I modernized the shield right at the time when the old heritage shields had this highest value. So my timing was terrible. So in the end, we've sort of lent back to the old shield because retro athletic is so, so respected. Yeah. Right? But in our back pocket is 
um, is this new shield. And I think the way I best would describe it is you don't want an old 90s shield representing the company. You know, we want to be a modern dynamic company that has heritage product in our portfolio, not yeah. heritage old company. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everybody's yeah. shifting toward these dynamic direct to consumer progressive brands. They're, they're disrupting every industry, right? So for every old Samsonite, there's an away luggage or, um, and and why are people gravitating towards away versus the older world? Because it's new, it's fresh. You can you know who the owner is. You've heard their story. They're doing it really good value because it's direct to consumer. They're using conscious materials. They're yeah. transparent, right? All of the good things. So how do we have to as an as a old company or an old not an old company but an old brand, a heritage legacy brand? Is can we act? as dynamic or even more progressive than those DTC brands. And that's that's what I think about every day. What, what, do, you, what do you think when he hears things like this, Barney, from, uh, from I think it's just Phil, um, when I hear of K-Swiss, I think of Gary Vee, only exposure I've ever had to K-Swiss. What, what does that say to you? That says my, I did a good job. I mean, <laughs> because, I, was hoping so. I mean, there you go. I mean, the thing is, it's like that. So Gary brought, this, brought him in the door. Sorry, I forgot his name. Um, uh, Phil, I think, on this one, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a good point from Phil, you know, and that's true. And and so number one is that's that was my intent is Gary V would bring eyeballs to the brand. So um, and so you know, good job. We got Gary in the door, but now we we have to like keep him educated and entertained on. Okay, what else do you got? You know, Gary V's the hook, um, and but but now we have to deliver great product. We have to continue storytelling. Um, and and it has to still have that vein of entrepreneurship through it so that you don't hook someone with entrepreneurship and then talk about tennis all the time, um, mm. but still have yeah. the, the bones of the DNA of what you stand for going through that thread. So if you look at our, our social channels or our Instagram, you should see a combination of like a preppy vibe with some entrepreneurial language in there um, and, and some tennis, you know, and then if, that, if we're doing that, then that's that's we're delivering on what we're trying to do. No, no pressure, Omar. <laughs> you just sort all that out for us. But you see, you say that he's going on, like, you're doing Instagram lives and stuff. And obviously, um, Barney, you've done podcasts before. And so, content creation, do you see that as a vital part of a brand? Yeah, absolutely. We we built a pod. Sorry, we built a podcast studio in our office. Like I don't know, over a year ago. Um, I just we and I did it myself. I think I, I actually got the the little foam squares from Amazon. That's those acoustic tiles you've got over one wall it looks, cool. in the studio. It looks great yeah. right and and i hung the shelves in there myself i bought some of my art from home hung on the walls and created a podcast studio and we just started creating a show it was called ceos wear sneakers and we would interview young entrepreneurs and i'm telling you this is going back i mean over a year um and that's content creation it's like why not and we created a show called inside k swiss where we would um, do a like a vlog following that Gary V model of like what's happening at the brand because I'm thinking here we are as a group of young people myself excluded in the, in downtown Los Angeles trying to bring a sneaker brand back to to prominence with all sorts of creative people coming into the office and 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 doing some amazing things with some amazing people through the lens of a sneaker brand like that's interesting to people right so we created this little vlog show. Yeah. And and we were getting thirty to fifty thousand uh, views on on each of those episodes. So again, that, when I talk about transparency, I'm like we're living it, you know. And I think now the quarantine has created even more acceleration of um, of like live streaming. And now everyone's doing this appointment based live streaming. So not just I'm going to randomly go on and see who who comes on, but say hey, you know, at one o'clock, and, and we actually do a, a weekly one now. Um, but I think what we've got to do, and this is the direction I'm going, is to actually brand our content into show formats. That's, to me, where I want to take this so that yeah. instead of doing a weekly uh, Instagram Live is give it, a, give it a, a purpose of that. Maybe it's about sneaker design, and it's like our sneaker designers go on and do Q&A or, or take you through the journey of designing a shoe and call that show something about, you know, inside the cobbler's shop terrible example but brand it and make it a five-part series every friday bang 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 and then once it's done do another one 
So I think branded show format, but done through live streaming or through TikTok or through Facebook or whatever it is, is where I want to take this thing. And, and that's advertising. It's essentially advertising and put all my ad dollars into that. It's interesting. Uh, my friend Paul, uh, he's uh, talking about the fact that he's a 43 year old uh, entrepreneur. What is that? A couple of times we said across the show, um, young entrepreneurs, you know, what What about the people like some Paul and I? Are we, are we yeah. still cool are funny? Are, are we still on brand? Absolutely, because entrepreneurship is, a, is, a, is a, yeah, no, you're right. And I do say young entrepreneurs. And the reason, and I shouldn't do that, but the reason is. I'll is take that. I'll take that. That's fine. Yeah, because the truth is, is, like, young people aspire up and old people aspire down, and we're all trying to be like a 25-year-old, okay? So teens want to be older, we want to be younger, and the actual core group you want to sort of emulate is this middle set. Even though if I position myself, say I'm this, you're going to get both the others too, okay? So in other words, don't market to me like I'm a 47-year-old suburban dad, because that is what I am, but I think I'm a global, cool, <laughs> You know what I mean? Like if don't don't market to me directly at me, go above me, and I think I'll aspire to think that's what I am. You know, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting because yeah. Gary talks a lot about his age as well. Um, he he says he's got so many years left. He feels dead young. I feel young. He is Nicholas, who who's a similar age, saying she feels good and, and young, and there. Uh, yeah. And entrepreneurship's a mindset. That was my main point is it's not about how old you are. It's like, you, you know, there's like there's like kids at 10, 12 years old who show up to events who are running their own businesses and making little brands. And there's people in their 60s who are who are branching out and doing great things. So it's a, definitely a mindset. And and to be honest, case Swiss is consumer slightly older anyway. You know that once you get down to that 18 to 22 year old, um, especially in the UK, it's so difficult because they're so focused on like one brand. It's like everyone's wearing the same Nike shoe. Um, yeah. And God, God forbid you step out in something different. Everyone's like, oh, what are those? You know, it's like <laughs> just following this like same formula. And everyone thinks they're yeah. influencers, but they're all wearing the same stuff down to the style and the colorway. You know, like there's not a lot of prizes for being unique in, uh, in when you're young. You know, it's like nine out of 10 kids just want to fit in. And, um, so it's a tough place to to win and then of course all the sneaker stores are sort of consolidated down to about two companies that run everything in the uk so again it's really hard a brick and mortar to break into that um in, into that market yeah we've got a question here from scott there barney um having your father and grandfather as such great entrepreneurs and role models did you have any other role models from the fashion industry and and, and scott mentions a particular example vivienne um, I would say that, I mean, I think my mentors have been uh, my, my, my bosses or managers in the companies I've been in. So not necessarily from a, from a fashion perspective, but more from like a leadership and a business perspective. I've had great people who I have taken um, things from and over the years. So I don't, yeah, I think it's much more from a business perspective um, that I've found that I've looked for for mentors. You know, when it comes to fashion and creativity, is like I'll contribute to that and I'll 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 be trying to take us down a certain path, but I'm not the one who's going to determine what material is used or the 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 specifics of a uh, of a sneaker design. You know, uh, if you ask my designers, they'll tell you I'm like meddling around their 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 off their desks and like poking over their shoulders, but. Generally, I don't get too, too involved. And there's certainly like brands that I've always loved that um, have stood the test of time and things like that that I'll look at. But I think for me, I'm, I'm definitely looking at it more through like the lens of, uh, of business that I'll, I'll focus on more so than the fashion specifically. Yeah. What's the, uh, if anyone has any questions, by the way, feel free to drop them in the comments. What, uh, what's next then? Bonnie, for you. So, um, in terms of projects, obviously we've been locked down now. Is this something you're really itching to to get your teeth into when we get back into into the workplace? Yeah, yeah, I don't think things have really slowed down for me, to be honest. It's it, it hasn't um, really stopped us by being home. I think the technology is just working so well, 
And um, it's been so functional, you know, in terms of how we're able to still um, work together as a team that I don't think that's really anything is uh, waiting. You know, we're still doing everything. I think the biggest thing for us is we're going to launch in China. So our Chinese ownership that bought the brand, bought it to really execute it over there, that they have their own brand called Xstep. And they have 6,400 stores, like Xstep stores that are head to toe running brand, a running brand that's domestic China only. So it's probably the biggest sneaker brand you never heard of. So their goal now is to add to that the, the American sneaker brand that they'll bring over to China and start opening K-Swiss stores. So a lot of the work we're doing now is in terms of product design and marketing evolution of the brand position is, is to get ready for, for the China launch in mid-21. And will, will the design be different for the Chinese market? Um, there'll be some, like, you know, I think nowadays everything's so global that your your core product line okay. is the same globally. Say it's like 80%, 70 to 80% global consistency and 20 to 30% regional um, special product that just responds to lo local market trends. But these days, if something, you know, trends could start in Korea and then blow up overseas, you know, um, things could start in Paris and then be the hottest thing in China. And, and, and the speed of adoption now is like days. Mm. Uh, it's amazing. So, um, but, but we'll certainly create more product. When you have a retail store, you've got, you know, 50 shelves to fill. Whereas when you're selling to say a JD sports, you may only be getting two or three shelves. So your product line is a lot more narrow when you're trying to sell through wholesale. When you do it yourself, you've got to, you've got to carry the whole store with one brand. So the, the, the product line has to be a lot bigger. That's, that's what we're, we're working on. Has there ever been a, um, a line where it's just failed and there's a warehouse full of them? <laughs> oh God, yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah. The warehouse is littered with aisles of my failures. <laughs> Who, whose ass gets kicked then? Is, is it your own? No, I mean, I think, look, you, you, you know, as long as you go into something with the right, uh, the, the right, um, you know, analysis of, do, of doing something, if it fails, it fails. Like the key is not to do it twice, um, but doing something once and, and getting it wrong is okay. Doing something twice and making the same mistakes, not good. Um, but, you know, what you're hoping is that the wins o overshadow the losses. And we, when, you're, when you're dealing with a multi-skew product line, you're going to have winners and losers and you're essentially over over the arching uh, of the year for example is you're looking what's the at what's the balance average um margin and as long as that's healthy you're good but and it, and within that you're going to have some things that sold out you didn't have enough inventory of god i wish we had more and you have things you have too much inventory of but essentially you're looking for the balance at the end and anything that's still in there you've got to liquidate so now you're taking um you're discounting and and in some cases you might take uh you might take a loss but just to move the goods out um but as long as your balanced uh margin at the end of it all is positive then then you're good and that's just like good demand planning and good buying uh to to know and to try and get that right of not having too much but also not having too little yeah sure pascal's got a question for you there bonnie any interest in r d around digital consumer service perhaps reinventing the online shopping experience? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that we're, we're definitely not leading in the area of like innovation in customer service. I, I wouldn't, I would say that we're not doing an awful lot there. Um, and we're, pro we're probably just, just, just sort of hitting the, the, the industry standards. We, we have just put a new e-com team in that is making a lot of great strides in, in our e-com practice. And e-com is one of those areas right now that's doing really well, like we talked about earlier. So, I think um, certainly my priority is that's the one place you want to double down on is is the is the customer experience on 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 ecom you know so you know social shopping um, all of those things I think is where we'll see uh, some investments or innovations is how can I get someone from Instagram right into the shopping cart or, um, or or wherever it is or like if we're in this situation someone's like God I haven't seen cases for ages you know wow it used to be really cool you can quickly go and see the old case was classic or and and then maybe you buy it right there and then so there's a gap now between the content and the and the actual transaction um that if you can if we can shrink that or minimize that then that would be 
um, you know, a lot, a lot more efficient. And, 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 and that's way away from where it should be for everybody. Just before we wrap up, Barney, I wouldn't mind just hearing a little bit about yourself in terms of leadership. Um, do you have a mentor? I know it's a, it can be a lonely journey being at the top. So what do you do to keep yourself uh, mentally he- healthy and, and to, to bounce ideas off people? Um, yeah, I think, well, it, it can be lonely, but it doesn't feel that way. You know, sometimes you sort of hang it, you're out on a limb in terms of um, decisions, you know, making decisions. So certainly there that can be like, God, it's just me and, and um, I wish you know people don't know what you're actually doing behind the scenes. But we have a really close knit team that likes each other for the most part. So I definitely <laughs> feel like, yeah. So um, so so generally, it feels like a fun uh, journey. My career, I love my job. I love going to work because it's great people, and we're all kind of trying to achieve the same thing. So so from that perspective, I think it's not lonely at all. I think in terms of bigger decision making. Um, yeah, it can be tough, but like it's a choice. You know, I've chosen to put myself in this situation. It's like, am I? I always think, am I thinking big enough? Am I doing things? Am I not shying away from tough decisions? Or, or if things are tough in terms of having to make big decisions, I'm like, that's what I'm here for. You know, that's my. Don't complain about it. That's what your people are relying on you to do. That so, so step up to the to the challenge sort of thing. Um, mentorship from leadership nowadays it's not really people it's not there's no one I really phone and go like am I doing the right thing if I do that's really family to be honest that's my wife that's my sister that's my stepfather I'll talk to them all the time about if it's really innermost like god am I doing the right thing I'll rely on my family um, mm-hmm. and then and then I'll read a lot you know I study a lot of uh, books and um, websites culture I'm constantly consuming all that stuff to try and like and then I'll write notes if I find something that's really good I'll kind of I'll write it down and I'll have a lot of things that I keep that I've just pieces of information I'll I'll I'll, I'll keep and I'll look back on I read books I write I write my own like cliff notes my own book reports you know what I mean so you know it's a bit nerdy but I'll read with a highlighter pen and then I'll when I finish the book I'll go back and I'll write all my notes out and then a year later I someone's like did you read that book I'm like yeah and I can pull up my own book report and I've got a one pager that puts all the all what the highlights were for me. Do you, do you journal? No, not not um, no, not about life. Mm-hmm. But, but I did, but kind of for 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 the for the business. Yeah. And you know, I did just run a book club for the company. Like I picked six books during quarantine and said, pick your book, and everybody reads a book mandatory, and then we'll do six book club Zoom meetings where we'll talk about what did the book mean to you and what did you you know so. Encourage the company to great takeaway. Last one then. participation, which was disappointing. Sorry, say so again, you haven't got much participation. About fifty percent, which was disappointing. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> um, Katie asked a great question here, Barney. Um, she asks, "It would be really cool if you found a successful female entrepreneur and had a partnership with them, just like just like you did with Gary V." Yeah, and let me tell you, uh, I've there's a few that I've tried. So, okay. my I'll tell you my wish list. My my number one was um, um, Emily Weiss of Glossier, and um, I thought she's like the poster for uh, a great um, a female entrepreneur. And all of my um, efforts to to have her come on to come and do something because she's so pop, popular and successful right now is like she I, I think it was a window i could have got her to be the female gary v and i think a lot of women look up to her and her success the other one that we we were really close to um was a was a company called boss babe and in fact they were from i think yeah. natalie ellis is from newcastle do you know boss babe jump in the drop red text barney are you is she a friend of yours sorry i lost you there is she a friend of yours no no but that, we're gonna make that happen i'm sure <laughs> yeah so no but actually we, we talked to them a lot but they were it ended up being a trademark thing that we couldn't end up putting the brand on the shoes but we actually had we had final samples made of a of a shoe around boss babe which i love because it's this 100 percent female voice about you know women ceos and 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 um and the other one was Girl Boss. So I tr- Girl Boss was a little too out of our price range. Emily Weiss didn't return my calls. Boss Babe, we were ready to go, had the shoes ready. to ready. They're still in the, in the office. And we couldn't, uh, because of Hugo Boss, we couldn't, 
we couldn't do them at the last minute. So it, it's not for want of trying. Okay, okay. <laughs> Paul's just saying he knows Natalie. We could have sorted that out for you. <laughs> well, no, I mean, we work with her. We, we, I met her. She's great. And uh, yeah. we, um, we, we were both, you know, both of we, she was down. I was down. We were ready to go. We had the shoe, but we just uh, we couldn't put it out because of trademark issues. Um, um, anything with boss on it is obviously like you're getting yourself into hot water and we didn't really get that figured out till, till too late so no we, we spoke to Natalie and I'm, a lot of um, respect for her and what she's done and just the way she thinks and the way she operates amazing how she's she's like she said she was from a little house in Newcastle and she's in LA running this amazing organization and um, yeah Ashley King yes we are talking about Natalie Ellis and um yeah, and I felt like, wow, she is what I'm talking about in terms of this entrepreneur. And, you know, it's not about athletics. It's not that she's a fast runner. She's not a rapper. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Like, I believe that people look up to her and say, I want to be like that now. I don't want to be the just play for Man United or, um, you know what I mean, be the next Stormzy. I want to be the next Natalie. I think it's relatability, Barney, you know, that we're, you and I are never going to run in nine and a half, ten seconds, right? But, yeah, you know, there's, there's, exactly. there's stuff we can do. We can do yeah. anything. Yeah, and you could stick, you know, and these days people are doing it. They put one T-shirt, they stick it on Instagram, and then they're like, hey, I'm the CEO of Barney's T-shirts. And, and in their mind, that's the CEO mindset. And, you know, fair play, you know, and that's the mindset of – the person I'm talking to, and my belief is there's more of them than people who are trying to be the fastest runner in the neighborhood. I totally agree. I totally agree. Well, Bonnie, listen, thanks so much for your time. I loved your open, honest transparency. I tell you, as we, we had a chat yesterday, I think what we said was you're not going to get the president of Nike, but we'll get you. And I think some of these larger companies turn like oil tankers. By the time they decide to do something, sometimes the opportunity is gone. And what it sounds like is you guys move fast, you're agile, you're able, you listen, you you, you want you want to be authentic, and, and I love that. Yeah, and I think if you've got a strong competitor, is how do you use their size against them? It's like the principle of judo. You know, is uh, is you know if you're facing a bigger competitor, how do you use their momentum um, to trip them over? And and so then that idea is like I don't think Nike is going to be able to be as nimble to do things like this or to do podcasts because to try and get through the PR red tape and the management sign off and they'd never be, you know, whereas we can. So if you're not doing it, you're not using one of the few advantages you have. Yeah. It's the judo Fantastic. principle. How do you use a competitive size against them? The judo principle. That's a good one for s small businesses. Excellent stuff. That could be that could be that that could be a fantastic place to leave it. I think we should kick you out, Barney, right? Out of this stream, but I'm gonna kick you out with one of your own shoes. How does that make you feel? Uh, How does that really make you feel? <laughs> okay, brother. Well, thank you so much, Barney. I've loved it. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thanks, man. There you go. How fantastic was that? Barney was absolutely amazing, and that's gonna make uh, a wonderful podcast uh, audio interview for you to listen to whilst you're running and riding because there's some absolute gold in there. I'm going to listen to that back as well and uh, do what Bonnie says in terms of writing these up the cliff notes. I'm sure there's a few notes for us there. Thanks so much for engaging uh, on online uh, live. I know these get watched multiple multiple times back when it when it's not live so so thanks so much for for continuing um thanks so much katie ashley pascal great stuff paul um as if you've just used a shoe <laughs> well, yeah <laughs> i wonder if that's the first time barney's been kicked with one of his own shoes You'll, we'll never know we'll never know okay well thanks so much guys and i look forward to live streaming with you again soon okay take care be safe <laughs>